Okay, so let's get started. Happy Halloween. Uh, sorry, I forgot to wear a costume, but that's yeah, normal me today. Uh, I thought you'd be interested in this graph. Uh, these are the views on my YouTube videos for the last week. I don't know if anything important happened on the 29th, but you can see this spike of 600 views. Actually, I think watch time is more probably interesting. That's uh, 8,595 minutes. 8,595 divided by 60, that's what, 143 hours? Uh, which is five, six days worth of viewing on one day. So, I guess hopefully it was helpful binge watching all the lectures again. Sharp decrease, though, you can see after that date. <laughs> it's almost like you don't care about this class after the midterm is over. Oh, uh, it's all right. Okay, cool. So I decided to give you a little break. There was no homework assignment released on Tuesday, but we will have a homework assignment today. Uh, this should be a pretty fun assignment. I mean, they're all fun, but uh, the goal here is to get you uh, cracking password, hashed passwords. So, so uh, you'll have the due on the 11th, so what's that, 12 days, something like that, roughly a week and a half. Um, there are four parts, one, and so you can find your hashes on the submission website. You go here, you'll see your custom, your hashes that are just for you. So the goal is to find passwords that hash to that value. So the different hash functions we'll look at, uh, the first one is MD5. So in each of these hashes, I've given you some sample words and what they hash to so that you can check yourself. If you're going to try to implement your own whatever MD5 cracking, you can do that. Um, there's also some leaks in here about what, how big the password is. Um, so MD5, SHA-256, part three is bcrypt. Um, so you'll see, and I'll actually show it here. Um, so you'll see my bcrypt password here, part three, keeps changing. Why does it change? What was that? Salt. Yeah, the salt. So the salt, every time it's generating this, it's generating a new salt. But it's all the same password that hashes to the same value. So you can take whatever one, it doesn't really matter. Uh, you can dig more into bcrypt, but you can see that Adam hashes to this value or this value, and ASU hashes to these values. Uh, questions on those three parts? Hmm. I will say, then there's, you're free to use uh, any resource or program to help you solve this challenge except for each other, right? So do it on your own, like we've done in the past. There's a ton of open source software. Uh, John the Ripper is a password cracker that's used a lot of times to crack this kind of stuff. So feel free, read the documentation for John the Ripper, figure out how to get the hashes into the input that it needs, and let it hash away. Um, there's also a lot of different password cracking software out there. Feel free to use whatever floats your boat. Um, you can also do it custom if you want. That's totally fine. Any questions on the first three? So, uh, which one is using the salt again? Is it all of them? Or? Just bcrypt. Okay, bcrypt. But it, the salt really doesn't matter. It's just take whatever the hash is, and that's yeah. what you're trying to reinforce. Okay. Yeah. Or guess. Different ways to approach it. Yeah. I guess we'll get instant feedback on whether it's on submission or whether we got it right or not. Yes, for sure. The submission server, it's not currently up now, but I'll have it up where you submit your thing, and it'll tell you right away, yes, this is correct, give you points. Um, it should also be obvious, because you run that password through MD5, and you get the same hash. It's not tricky. Anything else? Cool, part four is a fun part. So this is a custom hash function. So this is not something that uh, exists. It's something I made up for this course and this hash function. Uh, you could say somebody wanted to try to design a hash function that was a lot slower. So you take the input to hash and you run it through MD5 a thousand times. So you feed the output of 
75, add the X string into the next one, and keep doing that a thousand times. Then you run that result a thousand times through SHA-256, and then run that time a thousand times through SHA-512. Uh, so mathematical notation looks something like that. You're continuing to pass the string in a thousand times 75, a thousand times SHA-256, a thousand times SHA-512. And so that you can check your own implementation that this is correct, you can check that Adam hashes to this in the system, ASU passes here, and security hashes here. So you have hashes that you can check to verify that your implementation of this is correct. I would recommend not writing uh, MB5, SHA-256, or SHA-512 by hand. There are plenty of libraries, you're doing this on your own, you can write this in whatever language you want. And so there's uh, a little bit of hint here that the user was quite lazy and the password is five characters lowercase. Questions on that part? Okay, then part five is uh, the final part, the 10 points of extra credit in play here. It's the same custom custom match function of part five, but the password is more difficult, so we're not giving you specific character ranges or lengths or whatever. You've got to try to figure that out on your own. Yeah? Since you made up the function, you said it's quite lazy and it's five characters, is it just you okay? You can definitely check that. <laughs> so that's up to you to figure out. So we're not giving any hints about what the passwords are. Or I guess I should say, phrase it this way. Every hit that we're ever going to give is on this page. So we're not going to give any information that's not on the assignment description page. How long does it take to run that hash function once? Like five minutes? <laughs> no, they're very fast. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's pretty quick. Uh, I don't have the timing off the top of my head, but it's not a, it's not slow like decrypt, but it's like slower than just a D5. Anything else? Uh, should you wait till the 11th to start this project? Yes. So, yeah. Yeah. What will happen if you wait till the 11th to start this project? Let's phrase it this way. Don't be the Yeah, you're, you're fundamentally searching through a space trying to find matches that match, right? So maybe you're. Uh, a couple things. So, A, if you wait until the 11th to start this, uh, you're going to have to try to figure out how to do MD5, and then once you figure it out, that you've got to do shock 256. This stuff takes time. It's not instantaneous, right? Um, what would what would be a good strategy or technique to see if you're on the right path? So let's think about for part four, even, this custom hashing algorithm. Uh, so you run it. It's running, it's calculating hashes. You're just going to wait for 11 days and see if it spits out an answer or not? I probably, you probably first test it with like a really easy password you make, and then against a hash you made. Yeah, so test it against a known username and hash that it should find very quickly, so that you can test that it works, right? So if you don't perform that step, you may have messed up how you're either generating the hashes or how you're iterating over that search space, right? So if you mess that up, then you will fundamentally not find it because your code is broken. Does that make sense? So it's always helpful, even if you're using for the other assignments or the other parts, John the Ripper or any of these kinds of tools, you can feed it other hashes that it should find. Right? Because you know it's MD5, you can feed it other hashes that it should be able to find. And then it should tell you that those hashes before it finds the other one. And there you know that it actually works. Yeah. I know it's like unlikely, but uh, when checking the so does it check that we got the right password or that hash is the right thing? I don't remember, and I think given the search space, it's functionally okay. yeah. unimportant. <laughs> but yes, if you find some input that hashes to the hash that you have and the server doesn't accept it, let me know. But I, I'm fairly certain that will not happen. But maybe, yeah. Um, I want to try to do the building it myself. Do you know, does John the Ripper use any like, special technique that we don't know yet? That what makes it more efficient than just brute force? Uh, I don't know if John the Ripper does. I know hash cat some of the um, password crackers will take advantage of the GPU if you have it. So okay. GPUs allow for like massively parallel computations. 
Um, so you can search through significantly more with the GPU. Um, so that, I think those tools are nice because they actually will do that. I think last year somebody tried to code up, because CUDA is the language where you program a GPU in to do these kind of uh, transformations, and they tried to do this algorithm in CUDA, but I don't think we're successful. Not that it's impossible, it's just they weren't able to do it. But that would be cool. All right, so standard operating procedure, like always on the submission, uh, submit the password and your readme um, in the description of how you broke or reverse the hash. Any more questions on this? Host C 
can send an arbitrary provider list A that says, hey, 192.168.1.10 is actually at B-A-D-B-A-B-B-A-B-B-A-B. Well, that would be the last time I say that. Um, the attacker's MAC address. So what does host A do when it receives this ARPR reply? It changes its cache. It updates its cache and says, oh, great. Uh, this 192.168.1.10 is at the now attacker's MAC address. Right? Because we just talked about it. There's no security. There's no authentication. There's no way for host A to verify that this ARP reply came from host C or host B. Now what happens when host B tries to send a message to host A? It's going to go to host C. And then can host C actually send that packet to host B? And then what's going to happen if host B wants to reply? It'll send to C. It should send. Right Right now it goes back to A because when host B wants to send an IP packet to dot 100, it looks at its ARP cache and says, oh, the, ARP, uh, the hardware address is that address for <coughs> host A, so that's how I'm going to send it back to. So in order to actually intercept both directions of traffic, right, they go from A to B and B to A, we need to poison the ARP cache of both hosts. So host C just uses the simple technique, sends an ARP reply saying, Dot 100 is at this MAC address. It host B updates its cache, and now anytime host A wants to communicate with dot 10, or, yeah, it should be dot 10. So whenever I guess that's the source, that doesn't make sense. So uh, whenever it wants to communicate with dot 10, it's going to send the packet to the MAC address that's at the attacker's MAC address. Is host B going to see this packet? Not yet, no. Not yet, why? Because C has to send it forward to B. But why doesn't the networking device send it to host B as well? Oh, because the destination is host C's MAC address? Yes, yeah, so the destination is host C's MAC address, and the switch, remember, is keeping a mapping of each port and what MAC address is it's seen on there. So the switch only sends it to the port that host C is connected on. So host B never even knows that host A was ever trying to talk to it. Then host C forwards that packet on to host B. What else could host C do with this packet before it sends it to host B? Change it. What else could it do? Read it. What else? And get rid of it, right? We've literally just iterated three the confidentiality, integrity, availability attacks that host C is able to do from this essentially trivial network attack. Yeah? What would happen if you tried to tell a compute, like, not that this would actually be a, I don't know if this would even work to be a real attack or what, but what if you, when A asked, hey, who has this one? You send the back its own MAC address. Would it actually believe you and try and send things back to itself, or like what, what would happen? I it would be operation uh, operating system dependent, so I don't know off the top of my head. I think it would probably ignore it, or maybe it would try to send it to itself, and then nothing would happen because it wouldn't reply to it because it's not configured to have this IP address, so it won't uh, reply to those packets. Uh, um, uh, I don't know. Yeah. Could you flood a server, say like? Say you're C, instead of trying to intercept traffic, you're just trying to overload one computer by saying, like, all IPs are at this MAC address. Mm -hmm. So every ARP request that comes on the server says, like, who has this? You're like, this MAC address. Yeah, so let's say this is a uh, very large network, right, with a lot of hosts. And one of the hosts is running, I don't know, let's say a web server or something, a lot of traffic. Or uh, you can do it either way, but yeah. So if you poison, let's say, every IP and every MAC address in here, you could then point everybody to one system. The problem would be is that system's not going to respond to any of those packets, so it'll generate a lot of traffic, but each of those hosts would be like, oh, this host is down. But I'm not sure how that would play long term, because I don't know if they keep sending that in there. Uh, but yes, yeah, so you could definitely use that to like... Bandwidth chokers. Exactly, like yeah. Cool. All right. Okay, but we actually have one additional attack that we could do 
at this level. So we're again, remember, just looking at local networks. So here, we were able to convince host A and host B to send data through us, at which point we could essentially do anything. But we could also, so, okay, let's think about it this way. When host B gets this IP packet, Right? It says the source IP address is from 192.168.1.100. How does host B know that that IP address actually sent the packet? It doesn't. Right? It fundamentally doesn't. There's nothing. We can go back and look at. You can look at the IP packet. Right? There's nothing there that says that that's the source IP address is actually who created that packet. So we can, without playing any ARP games as host C, we can actually impersonate host A to host B, right? Just by spoofing a packet and setting the source IP address to be host A's. So here we are, another situation. We have uh, three machines on the network, uh, .14, .76, and .121. So, as an attacker, right, so let's say that there's some trust relationship between dot 14 and dot 76. So, for instance, uh, you could say it's a network file share where files are accessible only to a certain IP address, right? This is how you can configure these systems. You can say only dot 76 is able to access dot 14, right? That's something we could definitely do. But now, when dot 14 get this packet that says that it's from dot 76 to dot 14, does it actually know it came from dot 76? No. No, right? So let's say that, so what's gonna happen <coughs> now, think about what's gonna happen now when dot 14 replies. What's that packet look like? Where, what's that reply look like, like the packet? Well, not necessarily the information in the packet. Yeah? Well, uh, the source would be uh, its MAC address, and so then the destination is whichever MAC address it was told was at that IP. Yes, but what about the IP? So what's the IP oh, source destination? Okay, it'd be um, point 0.14 is the source. Point 0.14 is the source, and who's the destination? Uh, point 0.76. Point 0.76. So does the attacker see that reply? Right, so without ARP spoofing, we won't see that reply. Do we need that reply? It depends on the application, right? Think about, um, so like we talked about, accessing a file on a file system. So the packet says, hey, I want to access file uh, secret employee data. Then what's the reply going to be? Okay, here's the data. But where's that data going to go? Does it come to us as the attacker? No. But what if we said, I want to delete file super secret data? Well, that'll do it, right? Yeah. Or what if it, yeah? Oh, I'm confused. Why, why does it not come back to us as the attacker here? Cool. All right, let's draw some pictures. Because in this one, he hasn't sent the ARP thing yet. So yeah, so no ARP spoofing. We haven't played any ARP games. Ah, shoot. Okay, just a second. I need to pause this. So, all right, same situation. A, B, we're C. So, we are, is it okay if I don't write all of the uh, IP addresses? One to one, this was dot seven six, and this was dot 14, right? So we're sending a packet from A to C and our IP packet looks like, so the source is, what's the source of our packet? Dot what? Well, based on the arrows, it's getting sent from us, but we're spoofing it as if it came from dot 14. Okay. So what's the source of the IP header going to be? Dot 14, and the destination? 
0.76. And then we have uh, Ethernet frame, but we'll ignore that for now. So host A gets this packet, says, okay, great, I'm gonna do something, and now I need to reply to it. So what information does it have to be able to reply to this packet? IP addresses, right? So it, um, right, so the reply will look something like, so now what will the reply look like? So the source will be what? Oops. Dot seven six. and the destination? Dot, what was it? One four? One four. And so when that packet gets sent out, it maybe has to do an ARP lookup to say who has dot 14, it figures out it's host B who has that MAC address, and then it replies back to host B. So we, as host C, because we haven't done any ARP poisoning or anything, we never see that response packet. But that may be okay, or maybe, and this has been done in the past, uh, where it used to be, instead of SSH, there was a Telnet, basically, which was a login protocol. And so many systems would trust and say, if we're inside, or if we're, maybe not inside, but we can say, if we're dot 14, then we can log into this system dot 76 without a password. So what you could do is send a packet that says, log in and run this command to give me access to the system. And even though you never get the reply, everything still works and is good. But we'll see this attack kind of extended in uh, later phases. Any questions on this? Yes. If your network card was in promiscuous mode, would you be able to see the packet? So let's think about it from the switch's perspective, right? So the switch is here. It gets this packet, um, which the source, and it's this reply. So the source is .76, the destination is .14. The, now the ethernet frame is what's important here. So the ethernet frame, what's the source ethernet address? So the source here is the reply from A to B. So A is generating this reply. So it's going to be the MAC address of A. And the destination, because we haven't done the ARP poisoning, A will have to use ARP to say who has, what's the MAC address of dot 14. Host B will say, I have the MAC address dot 14 of host B's MAC address. And so this reply's destination MAC address will be host B, which means that the switch sees that and it sends it out just on this port. If we're on a hub, though, we could then use promiscuous mode to see that packet, which is why that switch hub distinction is so important. Anything else? Cool. All right. Now, so we've looked at basically everything we're going to look at on a local network. So everyone fully understands how one machine sends data to another machine on a local network. So what's the process like? Nodded yes, but what's the first step? Yeah. Um, the sender sends out an ARP request for the MAC address of the like destination. Okay, address. what's step zero? What does the sender need to know? IP address. IP address of where it wants to send that to, and what else? What it wants to send. What it wants to send, what else? Tell me, please. Yeah, it has its own IP. Yeah. Its own IP, sure. The, the subnet mask, right? The network ID of what constitutes inside my local network and outside my local network. So they can use the target IP address or the destination with the net ID to say, is it local or is it not? And if it's local, then it has to go through ARP, so it maps the destination IP address to the source, to the MAC address. So it can create an Ethernet frame, send that off, done, right? The data does not have to go anywhere else. Of course, that does not answer the question of how does our packet get from our laptop to Google? Is Google on our local network? No, that would be bad, right? Or weird. So we need some mechanism to do this, but, and we'll get into the details, but it's actually not as complicated as it, as it seems because it's made up of all of these local deliveries doing exactly what we talked about. So, 
essentially, we need to extend one more piece of information to our step zero. So we had our address, the t our IP address, our IP address, the target, the destination IP address, our subnet, and then we need some notion of a gateway or a default of where do we send packets that are not inside of our local network. So here we have, on this server, we have its local network. Uh, we think we've seen this before, this is the submission server. It has its net mask. And uh, OK, there we go. So what we need is a routing table. We need to know, OK, if a packet is not on our local network, where does it go? So the first entry here, this default, says essentially if it doesn't match anything or any of these other rules, send it to 172.31.01 knows where it needs to go. And this actually makes sense if we go way all the way back, which I'm not going to do, I'll just redraw it, uh, to our drawing. So what we looked at here is we have some switch, right? And we had some hosts, a now host C will be a good person, right? So we have our local network, everything's great, but what actually makes this an internet as opposed to just a local network? There's some other network that we want to get to, right? So let's say there's a big, uh, so we'll say, okay, we'll use G for Google. There's some Google system somewhere. So how does our information actually get from us to them? What must be the case. Yeah. There's like an ISP switch between the two of those. Yeah, there needs to be some kind of connection between us and them, right? And fundamentally, what we need is we'll call it right now a router, but because that's the more term we're connect we're more familiar with. We need some local host on our network that knows how to get packets out to other networks. And then that is connected to something else that knows how to get packets out of its network. And that's connected to something that finally connects into Google's network. So for instance, and this is a key distinct, well, won't be able to too much, but so essentially my default route here would say, okay, if it's local on your network, send it out. Otherwise, if it goes anywhere else, send it to host R, because R knows where the packets go after this point. And then R sends it to its ne next hop, and then that sends it to its next hop, and then that finally gets to Google, where Google does stuff with it, and then replies backwards. So this is, but the nice thing is, and this is uh, the kind of thing that makes this conceptually not crazy, is that our gateway, or our next hop, is on our local network. So it's 172.31.01. So it's on our local network. We know exactly where it goes. So we can send the packet to 
it, and then it will know where to go. So let's walk through an example. Should we use the example of the actual IPs here? Sure. 172.31.0.1. We are about 25. 250. All right, we want to send a packet to 8.8.8.8. What is that? Google's DNS server, which also responds to ping requests, so we can easily ping it and see that it's up. It's actually, yeah, it caused us some trouble at uh, DEF CON CTF this year because we sent, told all the teams to use this as their DNS address, so when they connected locally into our network, and then somebody else above the chain saw a lot of weird DNS requests at 8.8.8.8, so they blocked that IP, address, or that IP address. And so all the players were complaining that the internet was down because they couldn't get to their DNS server, but if they used a different DNS server, it wouldn't work. Uh, anyways, we had to fix this by telling everyone to use DEF CON's DNS server because that was one that was not blacklisted. So that we were fighting all these automated detection systems. Anyways, let's go to this. Okay, so now we gotta say, Okay, what's this packet? So this IP packet, right, has some data that host A is trying to send to 8.8.8.8. So what's the source? .250. Yeah, dot .250, I'm not gonna write that. Uh, I'll write it all this time. 172.31.6.250. And the destination? 8.8.8.8. Why doesn't it put 172.31.0.1? Because what? We don't want it to like stop there. Yeah, because the IP packet right gets our packet from us to the destination, right? It doesn't specify what the next topic is. It says who is this packet trying to get to, right? We're trying to get the packet to 8.8.8.8, not our gateway. In fact, at this point, we don't even care how our packets get here. We don't care if uh, this bridge is through uh, pigeons or over um, microwave connections or up to a satellite and back down. We actually don't care as long as the traffic ultimately gets there. Okay, so our machine, we have this, we have some data. We want to send this 172.131.6.250. So, what's the first thing that we do? Check the net mask. Check the net mask. So, to determine what? If it's local or outside. Is this destination a local address or not? So, is 8.8.8.8 on this network? No. No. <laughs> no, it fails completely, right? There's nothing, not the same at all. So not on our network, so then what do we do? Send it to the gateway? Yeah, so we, slightly more precise, we'd look at our routing table to see exactly where it goes because you can have, the way this is set up is kind of nice in that you can have multiple routes to different things. You can have different routers that route things differently so you can go crazy when you're creating your networks. We don't have to get into all those details. Right now we can say we use the default gateway. So this time the default gateway is 172.31.0.1. Does it have to be a dot one? No. Yeah. No, it doesn't have to be a dot one. It doesn't. We just have to know what that gateway is, right? As part of being able to talk to remote hosts on the network, we need to know what that gateway is. All right. So now, what do we do? So we know it's not all, somebody on our local network, right? But we also just said, okay, we know we need to send it to the gateway, but we're not going to change the destination IP address to be the gateway's address because this packet is not meant for the gateway. But what do we want to have happen, essentially? We want to change the source address. The source address? But then how will Google know to respond to us when it finally gets that IP packet? Yeah. Could you do like a broadcast and maybe the gateway will pick it up based on the destination? <coughs> yeah, okay. So. We need the packet to get from A to R on our local network. 
So how do we get a packet from A to R on a local network? Yeah. So we need to send it to the router. We need to send what to the router? We need to send a packet to the router. We need like whatever we want. Like whatever, if I want to get to Google, I need to send sure. it to the router. And the router needs to know. Here's your packet. What do you want to do? So I want to tell it, I'm going to send from my device to the router. Yeah. And then the router's going to go, that's not a local IP address. And it's going to send it to some node that it thinks that. Yes, but pause. How did we get the packet from A to R? It yeah. has to know the possible. So. Send the packet. I don't know that I'll impossible. So like send this packet and another packet that's addressed to the router from there. Sure. And what do we have? How does pack? How do packets actually move? So when we looked at from A communicating with C, how did the packet go from A to C? Ethernet, right? At the local network stage, Ethernet moves packets from one Ethernet MAC address to another Ethernet MAC address. So we need that same delivery mechanism here. We need to encapsulate this IP packet inside of an Ethernet packet. So we need the MAC address So we need, what's our source MAC address? Yeah, we'll call it uh, MAC of A. Right, we know that. Yep. Then what do we need? The MAC address of the router. How do we find that out? Our request. Our request. How can we make an ARP request? You. All apps. But why can we make an ARP request? Let's say that. It's on the same network. And the broadcast. We know the gateway's IP address. We know the gateway's IP address. Yes, we know the gateway's IP address because it's part of the input to the system. Right? Just like before, when we want to send a packet from A to C, we need to know host C's IP address so that we can issue an ARP request to find out who has that MAC address for host C. So we do the same thing. We ask, we do an ARP request and say, who has the MAC address for 172.31.01? That broadcasts out just like you all said. That was very good. All ones broadcast goes to every host on the network. Uh, 172.31.01 responds back to us with an ARP reply. If you remember way back to when we were using TCP dump to look at the packets on that machine on the wireless network, we saw a lot of our replies which were from the router, from the gateway, because my machine was talking to, needed to talk to that machine because of this. So this is great. So then our destination here in the Ethernet frame is going to be what? MAC address of R. MAC address of R. So I send that out, I send that packet out on Ethernet, it goes from A to R, then what does R do when it gets it? Unwraps it. Unwraps it, takes off the Ethernet layer because it doesn't need this anymore, right? And then what does it do? Does it, it says, well, it first says, is this packet for me? No, it's not. If it was for R, what would it have? The destination. the destination would be 172.31.6.1. Is that a 6 or a 0? Go to 6. It doesn't matter. Right? So if the destination of the IP packet said the router's IP, it would go, oh, great, this is for me. I will respond. When you visit your wireless router's configuration page inside your network, that's exactly what's happening, right? That's how it knows to show you a web page versus sending your packet along where it needs to go. Cool. Now R gets it. It says, is this for me? No. No? Then what does it do? Yeah, it needs to look in its routing table to say, where do I send this packet to? It's not quite as simple as a gateway, but it needs to know, based on this IP address, where does this packet go? And then it decides, OK, let's call this uh, alpha. Right? So then does it change the IP packet to change the destination to be alpha? No. No. What does it do? Creates a new Ethernet frame with, so let's get rid of this. Creates a new Ethernet frame with the source of what? It's MAC address. MAC address of R and the destination? MAC address of alpha. How does R know the MAC address of alpha? R request. R. 
And then it sends that along, and then what does Alpha do when it gets that packet? Checks. Takes off the Ethernet frame and checks what? The IP address. Is it for me? Is it for Alpha? No. So what does it do? Same thing. Figures out where it goes, right? Figures out where it goes, says, oh, there's a beta over here that knows how to get 8.8.8 .8 where it needs to go. It sends the packet here. Same thing, Ethernet, source Ethernet of the MAC address of alpha, destination of the MAC address of beta. And then, I guess I actually missed a step in when we we're talking about R, alpha, and beta. So now what does beta do at this point when it gets that packet? Unwraps it, gets rid of the Ethernet frame, and then what? Says, is it for me? Right? Same thing. Is it for is it destined for beta? No. No. What's the third thing we missed? Is it on the same network or not? Right? We missed the is this on my local network or not? So beta would likely have an IP address of uh, let's say 8.8.8.1 .8 with the slash 24, so we know the net mask is here, so the network ID is 8.8.8. .8 .8. So now what does it do? So it says this is in my local network, and then what happens? Makes an ARP request. Yeah, makes an ARP request for 8.8.8.8, gets the MAC address of G, and then sends a local delivery from here to here. All good. And then what happens when G responds to A? Just reverses the process. The exact same process happens in reverse. Louder, please. Is alpha and beta, if you look at like each local network, uh, are those gateways? Potentially. Because it gets tricky when you have ISPs that have multiple. So this is a very uh, simple view. But if you think that, um, we don't use CenturyLink anymore. Who do we use at ASU? Can you remember? Is it Cox? CenturyLink, I think we changed from CenturyLink though to somebody else. It starts with an H, it's not one of the like, Houston? people actually use <laughs> I think it's a satellite company, isn't it? Or satellite internet? My parents had that, they were not great. So anyways. So the important thing is kind of tied up in this question of, so let's say this is an ISP, right? They may have different notions of what is the best way to get this traffic to 8.8.8.8. They may say, because they may be connected to other ISPs, so here, let's say this is Google's ISP, uh, we'll call this Cox, we'll call some other ISP um, CenturyLink, right? So each of them are kind of each interconnected with each other, right? So Cox could actually say, even though I have an interconnect to, straight to Google, it actually may be more profitable for me to send this traffic first to CenturyLink and then have them send it to Google. So there's weird stuff that happens. But the other thing that can happen is the, uh, the path that your packets take to get there is not guaranteed to be the same path that it takes to get back because of weirdness, networks, you know, network stuff just happens, yeah. So wait, wouldn't this require our router to be connected to two switches at once? To like be the intermediary, or does that work? So the router essentially acts as both a router and a switch. So you can think of, so if you just buy a switch, like those devices that we saw on, on Amazon, they'll do no routing. You have to set up for each machine, and also we didn't talk about how you assign IP addresses, all that kind of stuff. Somebody needs to give out IP addresses or you set them all up statically. But, uh, so you can just buy a switch that just does this, or you can most, when we think of home use, right, we buy a router, which does both of these. So the router acts as your router, it acts as a DHCP server that gives out IP addresses to everyone on the network, and will act as your gateway out. Yeah. And then does, does the ISP hook up our router to other you're, usually there'll be a link from your router to the to your cable modem, I think, and then from there it'll go out like over coaxial, which I'm not sure the exact protocol that is. Uh, that's and Doxis. then it's, it's what Doxis, D O C S I S. That's right. I think I've heard of that. They can do weird stuff too. Um, 
So that, that goes from like your cable modem to your ISP, and then from there, it then needs to go further, um, wherever it needs to go, so, like, yeah. Are they ways like physical devices as well, so like how close would be like a computer, and like the gateways can deal with that Ethernet thing, and like the computer also deal with Ethernet frames? Yep, so you can definitely, like there's nothing that says router has to be like a dedicated physical box. It can be a uh, computer with two, but the key is it has to have two interface cards and it has to be able, you have to configure it and set it up properly. You can set up a machine for routing, which essentially means it will take in packets that aren't destined for its IP address, do exactly what we talked about, and send those off. Um, you can also do, we'll get to it I think a little bit later, but you also have this problem of your IP addresses, usually at home, are private network IPs like 192.168.0.10, um, that's not publicly routable on the internet. So your router's transforming your packet to make it seem like it's coming from this IP address that is publicly accessible, and then when Google replies, your router translates it back so that your machine thinks that it sends IP addresses of local addresses and just gets back replies to local IP addresses. Yeah? So once these packets frame say They, so fundamentally, yes, we don't care. All we care about at the IP level is we're sending an IP packet of this source, this destination, this data. So we don't care how it gets there uh, as long as it gets there to our target. So yes, you can, all kinds of weird stuff can and does happen. Uh, often transparently to you. You would never know that these kind of transformations happen. Um, so yeah, so internally the ISP may decide like, ah, Ethernet's too slow or crappy or whatever and do a completely different thing. As long as they send out on the interconnect, that interconnect has to work. And so both sides need to be able to take that IP packet essentially and get it to the next place. Yeah? So with uh, the connection from your router over to like Google or something like that, right? I get the router going to the ISP, mm -hmm. and that, that's easy enough. So that's where it's going to send it by default. But how does the ISP then know this packet that I have, this address is going to this Google? That could be like four or five node hops below afterwards. Yes, so it's like, crazy. So there's a whole protocol called the Border Gateway Protocol, I think is what BGP stands for. It is a protocol for all of these interconnected switches to say, and announce, hey, I send me traffic for like IP address uh, eight or the ranges. So it'd be eight dot eight dot eight slash twenty four. So this would broad like BGP. This network would broadcast that out to everyone else that says, I will. I know how to get that traffic home, and so everybody else will route through that. The crazy thing that happens is mistakes or malicious actions. So I think it was, I can't remember the country off the top of my head, but. No, it wasn't China, at least the case I was thinking of. Some country wanted to ban uh, YouTube from within their country, so they accidentally released a BGP route that told the entire internet, I route for YouTube.com. <laughs> and so everyone's YouTube traffic went to this ISP in this country that is not YouTube.com and can't respond to those packets, so from everyone else on the internet, YouTube was down. Just because this this uh, company or this ISP had accidentally announced this route, so the BGP is a kind of scary area because it's done at very kind of it's a very manual trusting process of what actually happens here. Um, but yeah, that's to answer that question. That's what happens, and you can look at the spec for BGP too. So RFCs. Did the YouTube or any other companies take steps to with that happening in the future? I think it was. I think it was Pakistan. Uh, I think it's more naming and shaming. Unfortunately, there's like only so much you can do. Uh, I don't. I will say I'm not 100 percent well versed in everything that that happens here, but yeah, it's definitely a known issue with kind of poor network. Anything else? <coughs> oh, we're almost done. Cool. So this is why we studied for so long 
the local area delivery, right? Because, oh, the other things we talked about uh, or we need to mention. So we mentioned in the IP packet, the TTL, the time to live. So essentially what happens is every hop here, right, from A to R, when R gets a packet, it decrements the TTL value. If it's zero, it drops the packet and doesn't do anything with it. If it's higher than zero, it passes it on to the next hop. So your packet's actually being changed a little bit. Let's go, um, I want to see. So the TTL here changes every hop, which then actually means that the uh, header checksum needs to change every hop because the packet is fundamentally changing because its value is changing. Um, all right. Okay, cool. So let's see, we talked about all this. Here's a uh, example of exactly what we talked about, of a packet getting one from one host to the other. So things that people often end up uh, messing up or have a misconception about. So here we have 111, 10, 20, 121, and 128.111.41.10. This is the destination. Does 128.111.41.10 ever know the MAC address of the sender? No, why not? Because all the routing is done using the IP address and the MAC changes on the top. Right, the only MAC address that is only, MAC addresses are only valid inside a local network. So nobody outside of that ever sees your MAC address, right? They all see new MAC addresses, yes. What about with IPv6? Yeah, weird stuff happens. <laughs> so an application or a protocol could choose to embed a MAC address into its protocol, but in which case, um, whether that's a good idea or a bad idea, the point is, uh, some people try to say, oh, well, dot 10 can just uh, filter a DDoS based on the source of MAC address. And that's definitely not true. Cool. Questions on routing? Getting packets where they need to go? All right. Um, Used to be, uh, actually a historical um, interesting thing is that it used to be that the person who created the IP packet could specify the hops that they wanted it to take. So they could specify the entire route from the source to the destination. Why would you do that? What's the benefit of that? Yeah. It's a lot safer. A lot safer? For, a lot for who? Less likely to get hijacked by some rogue router that could it's, it's like the moment you set it up wrong anymore, so you can set it to some bad character that you can go with it. So hop by hop ensures that you control every single piece of that journey. Assuming that everyone yeah. is properly following your route, right? They can choose to just send it in another direction and remove your source uh, specified routing. So yeah, so in some sense it's nice if you think about a lot of these old features are interesting to think about because you have to envision them in the context of an internet that doesn't really work. Right, where the, you just built this, the hardware is crap, the software is crap, like stuff doesn't work. So you need these debugging features in some sense to say, okay, I know that the path from, uh, let's say, ASU to uh, UCLA, because this is all like academics, you could specify the trusted gateways that would actually work and get your packet there. Uh, so in that sense, it's good. What's the downside of this? It may not be an efficient route, what else? Yeah, there's no redundancy, so if that route is not available, it's not gonna try to take another one. Yeah, it, it, it's uh, very brittle, right? Because if you specify this route, it doesn't work, your packet just gets dropped and nothing happens. What else? Yeah? Congestion. Congestion, in what sense? That, for that particular route, would have a congestion second. Yeah, so remember all of these, so if we go back um, to that diagram, right? All of these links have a, essentially a fixed amount of bandwidth that they can hold, right? A fixed amount of packets that can actually be sent. Once you saturate that, fundamentally you can't shove any more data across there, right? So, uh, so, so if I was an attacker and let's say I wanted to, let's say, 
kill this uh, uh, link, right? You can actually target specifically your packets to always go and maybe other you could get control of 10,000 machines on the internet in the form of a botnet, and you can make all of their traffic go through one route or one link, which normally, if this becomes saturated, they have other interconnects and other ways to go around that transparently ever to you. Um, so this can actually be weaponized by an attacker, yeah. But then as A, couldn't you use it to like avoid like networks that are untrustworthy? Like as A, you avoid alpha and you go through some tree link instead? Sure. How much do you trust Cox, though? Yeah, the, the problem is who do you trust, right? So. I guess like if you knew a route that was trustworthy. If you knew, then you could choose that route. But uh, anybody maliciously could alter that route, drop it, like uh, mess with your packet to say you don't, you know, not specify that. Anyways, that doesn't happen anymore, but it's an interesting like historical tidbit of like, would it be better if we had this? Would it not? It definitely. As the internet scales up to millions and millions and millions of machines, right, it becomes essentially unfeasible to specify <coughs> the source because you also need a way to discover what are the other routes, right? You need to know that map. Like, do you know any of the routes that are from here to Google? No. No, you fundamentally don't know. Okay. So you can look, yeah, so here's an example of a routing table. Um, it gets complicated, you can do cool stuff with it, but we won't go into super detail here. Um, we talked about this, this is actually everything that we talked about. We looked for matching host address, matching network address, and then a default entry, so it's just going through the route table, looking at those things. Um, you'll get a message back from your network, from your kernel, saying, hey, this uh, host unreachable or network unreachable, depending on what uh, the error message is. You can set and either statically change and alter your routes, or you can dynamically do this. This, uh, as you get more and more into networking, sometimes you have to do weird stuff that, to make stuff work um, or to get around certain things, and you have the power to change your uh, routes. Cool. Okay, so back to the layering. So now we've seen basically the core, right? Yeah. So so I was the the bullet points are search for a matching host, search for a matching network, and search for a default entry. And below that it says um, like if you can't find that host, but like why would it not find that host and not just like like because the default is if you does it match it, right? So I mean, what case would it not find a host and not use the default? It, you can have a network that does not have a default set. Okay. So that could be or you I think you get a different net. Um, you could set up a machine such that maybe it's only allowed to talk to two internal networks. So if somebody tried to send a packet out to the global internet, you would get an error, basically. Does that make sense? So like, <coughs> you're running a machine that should only talk to two networks and should never talk to the internet. So in that case, you, don't have to, you wouldn't specify a gateway. Oh, a default gateway. A default gateway, exactly. Yeah. But you could say, hey, for 8.8.8.8, send it to this machine. So you can get arbitrarily complicated with these things. Um, cool. All right, so now we've built up the core of this network, right? We have, at the physical layer, we saw, um, we didn't, so we saw our links, IP addresses to hardware addresses. The thing we didn't talk about is there actually is a protocol, somebody mentioned at the very beginning, there is a protocol that maps MAC addresses to IP addresses, uh, ARP, reverse ARP, but we, you're not going to get any details there. We have the IP level, so the IP level really is the level that gets us the ability to talk to other people on the global network. This is the idea that takes networking from an internal network that we control everything to the ability to send packets to another network and another system. What are we doing all this networking for? We want to exchange data. We want to write some app applications that actually do stuff, right? So we need some way to actually send data. So we need some types of protocols, and this is TCP and UDP, that actually will send data. And fundamentally, we can't forget, we always want to support applications. If we don't have applications, 
why do we do all this complex networking, right? So all this stuff is in service of actually doing real things. So the first thing we'll look at is UDP. So UDP is the, essentially, it's very, very similar to IP in terms of guarantees, which means that it's thought of in terms of packets. So you send an IP packet. It is connectionless, which means you don't have to establish any connection, it just you send a packet. It's unreliable. What does that mean? No yeah, no guarantee that it ever gets there. It's best effort service, which means that delivery, integrity, non-duplication, ordering, and bandwidth is not guaranteed. So none of these things are guaranteed by this protocol. So why is that useful? Yeah. Speed, just like uh, if you had to guarantee a connection before you start sending packets, that would significantly increase the latency. Of your Speed? So, so like in cases where it doesn't really matter if you're missing a packet? Like Sometimes you don't matter. Well, then why do we need this UDP layer? Why don't we just use IP? IP gave us all these things. IP has one of the size of I don't know. I can't remember off the top of my head. So let's think about it. Okay, so let's think about it this way. What did IP address, uh, sorry, what did IP let us do? Send between networks. Send a packet or some piece of information from one IP address to another IP address. Right? But we have many different applications running. Right? So we have HTTP, so in the case of UDP, we have DNS, NFS. How does the receiving machine know what application this packet is meant for? Right, so think about it in terms of this, we'll change our address metaphor and say that um, IP addresses and machines are like, uh, like apartment buildings, right? So if you try to just send a, a letter to somebody and address it to an apartment building, what's gonna happen? Go to the main office. It's gonna go to the main office or what's the problem? Why is it gonna go to the main office? Yeah, we don't know who it's going to go to, right? We don't know who, which individual unit inside this big apartment complex this letter is meant for, right? Similar thing here. We have different applications. They all want UDP packets, or they all want data. But we need to have some mechanism this, that the sender can specify this is for this application or this other application. Yeah? Just to make sure. So, like, IP will get it to Google's IP. And yes. And UDP will get it to, like, the cloud or whatever inside Google. One of their products. Definitely yes, but I don't like the general description of the cloud. Like okay, that. yeah, no, I picked yes. that one. Uh, let's say um, DNS, right? So 8.8.8.8 okay. is a DNS service, right? So how does it know that it's DNS versus uh, some other protocol that's running on there, right? So this is where we're going to, and this is really what, at the transport layer, this allows us to build different kinds of applications on top of this, because what we're gonna do is we're gonna, just like an apartment building, we're gonna number, we're gonna give a system ports. And again, so this is slightly, we use the same thing on switches, physical ports, right? Here we use the same terminology of port for um, UDP and TCP packets, as we'll see. But this allows somebody to send a packet to a specific port and IP address combination. So rather than just sending it to an IP address, we can specify what port this is for. And UDP stuff is, a lot of it is used for multimedia, uh, DNS, NFS, RCP, all kinds of stuff. So we look, UDP is kind of a thin layer on top of the IP packet. So we have the source port, the destination port. Again, just like before, we need to send our messages and we need to tell the other side how to talk back to us, right? It's like IP packets had IP source, IP destination. Similarly, UDP has source port, destination port, the length of the message, a checksum, and that's it. So it's a very thin layer on top of IP packets. And to go back to our, our diagram now, right? So we're actually as an application, we're gonna say, okay, we wanna send a UDP 
datagram or packet to this IP address and this port. So that port information is encapsulated inside the UDP header, which is sent as part of the IP data in the IP header, which gets it from us to Google. And at each hop along the way, this Ethernet frame is created to send it on local delivery from one to the other. So that when Google gets it, they can rip off, throw in this, look at the IP header, and say, oh, this is a packet for 8.8.8.8. .8 .8 .8. What port is it looking at? Throw this off, use the UDP. Ah, it's a UDP packet. It's for port uh, 23. Is that right? No, what's DNS? 53. 53? Yeah, OK. Cool. So pretty simple, right? Yeah. The purpose of the headers is to tell us, like, like for example, that it is UDP as opposed to UDP. Yeah, there's actually, it's kind of annoying. This is where that beautiful, uh, that's why networking people focus on all these beautiful abstraction layers, and that's why you know we have this nice diagram like this, but the layers bleed into each other. So for instance, if we go all the way back to IP packets, if I can find them, there we go. So if we go all the way here, Doesn't have it on here. Uh, but I believe, hmm, I think there's something in here that tells it whether it's a TCP or UDP packet in the IP frame. But I can't remember where that is. I thought it would be very simple. Service type? I think, no, service type doesn't make sense. HL, no. All right, I'll have to look that up and get back to you. So now we can use this to send data to a UDP packet. So what then specifies what's inside the UDP data? Are we going to have another thing in there and another thing in there? Like how deep does this Russian nesting dolls go? Yeah. It, it, it goes as, I guess, as far as from the, like the data part is going to be what data you're sending. And you're specifying the protocol. And the port number, I think, is actually not an IP header. It'd be the UDP header on the IP data section. So that's why it's not specified. Yeah, I think it's a hot or something. Or, there, something specifies, like, something tells it that it's TCP or UDP data sent as part of IP, I, I yeah. think. But I need to look at that. But yeah, so remember, the key thing is what's sent inside this UDP data is the protocol. Right? So whatever the protocol is, so for instance, DNS, so the domain name resolution maps google.com to a specific IP address. And it has its own protocol about what data is sent back and forth. So that we can ask our DNS server, hey, what's the IP address of Google.com? And it will apply, hey, the I here are five IP addresses of Google.com. And it's all specified in the DNS protocol, and that all gets sent just as this part here. But the nice thing as far as networking is concerned is we don't care. Right? The application can send whatever thing it wants in form of data. The network will do its best to try to make sure that it gets there. And so, since we have essentially the exact same, so what, what additional, let's go back to the header, so what additional security mechanisms does UDP add here on top of IP? Port. So it adds the concept of ports, does that give us any security? No, checksum. Checksums, well we can easily break, I mean, checksums are by nature reversible. So none. So that means all of the attacks that we looked at for IP work exactly the same on UDP. So this means that if we want to spoof a UDP packet, it's essentially IP spoofing. So we have a trusted client and a trusted server here, like we talked about with NFS, the network file system. So as an attacker, we can send so what stops us from specifying the client's IP address in our packet as the, the source? Nothing. What stops us, I mean, and fundamentally, that's what the server needs. The server uses that, that IP address to know where we're coming from. So we can fundamentally send a spoofed UDP request to a service running on the server with the source IP address of the client. And then who does the server think that packet comes from? The client. The client. It has no other information. It does not know. And again, this now, 
because we've talked about indirect delivery, this could be a completely different network than ours. It doesn't have to be on our local network. This could be across the internet. We can send any UDP packet to any IP address spoofing any source IP. So what's going to happen when the server replies? It's going to reply to the trusted client. So we're fundamentally not going to see this reply. Right, so this makes our job more difficult because we're now no longer on the same local network as the target system. If we are, if we are, then how do we get access to that reply? ARP spoofing, right? So if we use ARP spoofing, if we're either on the local network with the client or the server, or what else? Anything in between? Anything in between. Anything in any of those hops between the client and the server, if we can trick and use ARP spoofing or anything to get a hold of that packet, then we can see that reply. Yeah. Is it weird to like say that you want to be a router that's that um, helps traffic get through to where it's gotta go? Is it could you just do that? Depends on the network. Okay. I think sometimes yes, but not all the time. Okay. So alright. Good here. Here's Tuesday.